Anger. We all have a bit of it inside of us. You probably have done things in your past that you've regretted because of it. As children, we sometimes can't control it, lashing out in temper tantrums. Our parents and schools teach us, eventually, that this is not appropriate behavior. We learn that no matter how hard we scream or shout, we do not get what we want. We learn the harsh reality that we are not the center of the world and displaying such egocentric anger is the first step to get us into serious trouble. We all learn this, but what if you didn't? What if you continued acting this way all the way to your teenage years, your 20s, your 30s, even your 40s? What if you met a man who never grew up? Well then you'd get the legend that is Gary Yurofsky. How do you feel about it? You want to He's a fucking asshole! אוקיי, אנחנו מבינים שהדברים קצת יצאו משליטה שם, לא צפינו לסיים גם את הרעיון הזה ככה, אבל כנראה שזה האיש. How do you get here? What series of poor decisions do you have to make in your life to get to the point where you're screaming Hitler was a veg at the top of your lungs on prime time TV? In Israel. It's just pure comedy. And like you, the viewer, it was the clip where I was first introduced to the wonderful, wacky world of vegan animal rights activist Gary Yurofsky. A man for whom most of his career was an objective failure, but through the magic of the internet was given a random second chance. Overnight he became a sensation in the vegan community, but because of his ego, childlike tantrums and violent tendencies, in a few short years he would be run out of his own movement, isolated from those who supported him, a criminal indictment for his arrest, and finally exiling himself from the internet. This is a video made out of love. I truly adore this man. I can't get enough of his hilarious, angry, self-righteous takes on the Holocaust. Yeah. Uh, isn't it over the top? The animal Holocaust was happening long before the Jewish Holocaust, during the Jewish Holocaust, and it's still happening today. I find it over the top that the Jewish Holocaust is compared to the animal Holocaust. Because when you compare numbers, we're talking about six million Jews, and if you add up the other six million gypsies and blacks and Catholics and mentally retarded people, the Palestinians... ...is that I am a racist because in a calm and sober assessment of the Israeli-Palestinian situation, I said that Palestinians are the most psychotic group of people on the planet. I stand by that statement. Black people? If black people tried to get on a rescue helicopter with a dog or a cat, they were forced to leave the animal behind. Who's got it bad? Blacks or animals? Or how we should arrest lions for eating other animals. Whatever thing that comes out of this man's mouth is just wonderful. And I am a true fan. And I'm excited to share it with you. To share with you the man who never grew up. This video will document his life from the early 90s detailing every major event of his career until his tragic retirement in 2017. We do not know much about Gary's early career before he got into animal rights. What we do know was that before he was a vegan activist, he was an anti-racist activist. Active somewhere between the late 1980s and 1996. This period would not even be worth mentioning if it was not for three songs he spent $5,000 to make in order to promote his activism and ride the rap wave of the 1990s. Take a listen. Honestly, it's not the worst thing I've ever heard, but it's pretty bad. It's like watching $5,000 disappear in real time. It's entitled The Declaration of Misrepresentation, and you're like, interesting. This is a song about the African-American condition. The problem is he only does this for the first two verses and dedicates the rest of the song talking about how angry he is. Sometimes things really bug me. 
Like why does life have to be so goddamn ugly? I turn on the news and all I see is bullshit. It makes me sick to my stomach to watch it. Not only the murderers, the stealing and hustling, but the motherfucking government by the kin to me. Never had a problem, so nobody offend me. Don't got time for racism and bigotry. Stand up for my brothers and fight for equality. Yo, this goes out to the house, the senate, the government, the president, and the motherfucking supreme court. Y'all better check up the declaration of misrepresentation. The final words of the song is him encouraging fans to send it to government authorities, such as the United States president or the supreme court. Basically, he's vastly overestimating his rapping abilities. That said, his music gives you the basic impression of who Gary is. He's angry. Angry at the world, angry at the government, and most importantly, angry at you for not doing anything about it. He is looking for a cause, any cause, that could justify his anger and actions. It is this rage against the world that would get the man in constant trouble, because it would consistently manifest in violent or antisocial behavior. Gary achieved very little with his anti-racism activism. At some point in 1995, he would change his focus. He would be a militant pro-animal campaigner instead. What exactly caused this sudden shift is not clear, and Gary is a consistently unreliable narrator in anything that pertains to his interests. He claims that at some point he was at the circus, and according to him, he had a great time watching the performance. At some point, he went backstage and was horrified at how the animals were treated, particularly the elephants. This would be the primordial event that would set Gary on a path of animal extremism for the rest of his life. What do I mean by that? Well, 1997 was a big year for Gary. He established his strict vegan diet, and if you wanted to spend time with him, including eating a meal, you're expected to eat vegan. This includes his own family and would cause major problems later on. No, I think my mom is completely psychotic. I think my sister and her family are completely psychotic. They've actually stopped talking to me because I care about animals. In fact, I'll tell you about the last time we talked. It was August 19th last year on my birthday. I was passing through Illinois where they live to a place that just put vegan burgers on the menu. I assume we were all getting vegan burgers because I have a rule that I established in 1997 and it's if you want to sit down and eat with me, you eat vegan. Oh, we don't eat together. I'll see you later on. I hear macaroni and cheese being ordered. I hear a fish fillet being ordered. I hear a vegan burger from my nephew Jacob, and then I hear double cheese. So I explain to my family, I go, you guys know when the last time you saw me? It was one year and seven months ago before that. So we figured it out, it was about 585 days. I said, times that by three, three meals a day. So we agreed to about 1,800. And then at the top of my voice, I said, you guys have had 1,800 meals to eat whatever you wanted to eat. Today, when I'm in town, you can't have one meal without dead animals and the things that come out of these murdered animals. And I stood up and I left, walked out, called a taxi cab, took a taxi back to my mom's house, jumped in my car. And again, they still think that I'm irrational for this. Yes. It is completely irrational that he thought that screaming at his family in a public restaurant for eating macaroni and cheese was the best course of action. It is pure egotism to expect other people to eat how you want them to eat. As you can see, Gary has no conception that there are other people with feelings and preconceptions of outside of him. That even though his family hadn't seen him in a long time, he still couldn't understand that he was not the most important person in that room. This antisocial behavior obviously strained the relationship and would force him to look for validation elsewhere. Gary fell into a bad crowd, specifically becoming associated with the ALF, Animal Liberation Front, a notorious group which could be best described as criminal and at worst as terrorist. He's even got a tattoo of support on his forearm, which he displays proudly. And also, do you support the Animal Liberation Front? Definitely support the ALF, if you can see that. I got a tattoo on my arm right here. But It's unclear when he got radicalized by the group, but 1997 was a big year for Gary. At 28 years old, he would take his inconsequential activism and do something extreme. 
He would go to Canada and attack a mink farm, freeing the animals, and in the process, economically destroying a family. This was a plan that Gary was instrumental in organizing, and there were five of them. That included himself and his uncle. They moved against Ebert Fur Farm in Canada, releasing something along the lines of 1,500 minks. Each of these five criminals were captured by the cops, but the cops did not have evidence on Gary for a conviction. But it became increasingly obvious that Gary was one of the main instigators, despite being one of the youngest. So the cops put pressure on his co-conspirators, and as a result, his uncle and one other member rolled on Gary, and he was convicted and put in a maximum security prison for 77 days. Gary is not as smart as he thinks he is, because he committed the crime across national borders, which means that the state could label him as an international terrorist, restricting his ability to travel. He's honestly lucky that he got away with as much as he did. Naturally, Gary would blame the two that betrayed him for the rest of his life. About 1,000 minks were recaptured and about 400 or so died. Gary will say this is not the case, that the animal's natural instincts took over. It's a logical conclusion of what would happen to animals that have no experience in the wild. It is a documented phenomenon, and it's just irrational to claim otherwise. Gary would ride the notoriety of this event for the rest of his career and would utilize it to encourage donations and to establish his credibility with animal rights groups. But it meant now he had a serious criminal record and was banned throughout countries that may have listened to his message. Gary was in serious trouble because not only was he unemployable, he still owed money in a civil suit by the owners of Ebert Fur Farm. He was also in debt $30,000 to $70,000 due to his activism. Interesting fact, his mother and the woman he would later scream at for not eating vegan supported him by providing a bow during this difficult time. In his words, he would say that she was completely supportive. Nevertheless, if something amazing did not happen, his life would end at the age of 28. Gary is nothing if not lucky. PETA, an organization that Gary has criticized on every possible occasion, offered him a job as a public speaker offering him a salary somewhere along the lines of $30,000. As you can imagine, he changed his tune slightly and for the next couple of years would do speaking engagements for him. It was something he was pretty good at. Not amazing, but pretty good. This should have been the end of Gary's story, a cushy job talking about something he loved, but his anger, that need inside of him, would once again get the better of him. There are endless examples of this, but probably my favorite was a university talk he was invited to give in 2003 by a professor. The professor in question decided that he would provide a table worth of opposing literature describing the benefits of animal testing. Gary did not like that. In fact, he got a little heated. I will read the news report because it's just so incredible. Witnesses say Gary became angry when he saw the pamphlets, which included Animal and Science by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Shannon Miller, a biology instructor and organizer of the lecture, said Yurofsky became abusive towards her, even using the analogy comparing her to the Ku Klux Klan. Miller said she was particularly annoyed by the analogy since she had been part of a group that protested the KKK in Greenville just a week ago. She said as the argument became more heated, Yurofsky grabbed the cart and slung it, causing the pamphlets to scatter across the floor. ETSU public safety officers attempted to keep things from getting out of hand, but the lecture was soon cancelled and Yurofsky left the building. He was not available for comment. I don't know about you, but when a professor puts opposing opinions in a small pile in front of me, the most logical thing to do is to accuse her of being a part of the KKK. Then it's totally natural to throw a hissy fit and lift the table off the ground and throw the pamphlets onto the floor. This is normal, stable human reactions. It's a loss for humanity. This was not captured on film, but it's still magical reading about it. Naturally, it was this kind of behavior like this, plus his constant arguments with the PETA staff that got him fired from the organization. Gary, of course, would speak ill of PETA for the rest of his career. There's even a page on his website where he posts comments of his fans and makes him look like the good guy in the breakup. This is something Gary does. Whenever someone calls him out or you're not being vegan enough, he will post on his website to complain about you and post comments supporting him, stroking his bruised ego. When you listen to Gary, you're guaranteed to hear certain things. One would be the Holocaust. 
two would be slavery, three, violent and manipulative footage of animal farming, and four, an egotistical reference of Nelson Mandela, Martin Luther King, etc., and how he is like them. And finally, five, placing human emotions, feelings, and values into animals in order to sell his point that human suffering is equal to animal suffering. As a public speaker, he's only effective if he's preaching to the choir or that person is easily manipulated by violent imagery or false equivalencies. In any other circumstances, Gary is completely unable to adapt to changing situations or to read the room when a certain technique is not working. If his five or so techniques do not work, he either gets really angry. It was bad. It was bad. It was bad. Suck my fucking dick. Or unbelievably smug. Fair to pick one thing that lions do that you want to mimic when you don't want to mimic anything else they do. When lions walk up and greet each other, they sniff each other's ass. When I came in this room, you did not kneel down and sniff my ass. The mask he puts on of a man trying to make the world a better place slips, and what we see instead is the real Gary, an angry, disturbed, and egotistical individual. Gary doesn't like people. Incidentally, about that battle that white people had with natives over... America, it never belonged to either of you. This land belonged to the buffaloes, the squirrels, the deer, the bunny rabbits, and all the other creatures way before our psychotic, selfish species started raping and destroying it. Who's got it bad? Humans or animals? Which humans I hate more? When I have clearly stated time and time again that I hate all humans. And his contempt for everyone in the audience that does not think like him is palpable. This is above all his most severe weakness as a public speaker. The best public speakers convince you that it's not about the subject at hand, but convince you that you're the most important person in the room. The only person Gary has time for in his life is Gary. This means in perfect conditions, Gary can deliver a pretty good speech. So when the audience is receptive, everyone is silent, he can hold back his massive ego, and there are no tables for him to impulsively flip in front of him, he can do quite well. And Gary is not anything if not lucky. Because what happened next would define his career, and that is his niche famous speech in 2010. That's the clip I'm playing now. As you can see, there are no tables in front of him. Unlike most of his speeches at the time, this one was re released on YouTube on a channel called Animal Holocaust. His performance largely goes off without a hitch. It's not anything incredible, but the vegan internet and Gary himself, in characteristic humbleness, would claim this is the greatest speech you have ever heard. By pure algorithmic chance, this video went viral enough to become a staple of vegan culture. It wasn't particularly popular in the West, not at first. What its initial interest was a person from Israel so impressed by the speech, he translated the entire speech into Hebrew. The Israelis for some reason ate it up and it blew up virally. It was a pure statistical fluke, one that Gary would repeat constantly for the rest of his career. Despite translating the speech in over 30 languages, he never again achieved the same sec success as the Hebrew video. Overnight, Gary was something of a superstar in Israel, where there was a huge online following of fans, all of which were completely unaware of his history. Gary was given something very few people get, a second chance, and he was going halfway across the world to grab it. Gary is a lucky man because, being an ethnic Jew, he could enter the country despite being a convicted criminal. He would travel around the country giving talks to schools and universities. Now, the speech Gary gave in 2010 that started this internet fame is significantly toned down from speeches he usually gives, and he certainly does not tone down content for children. So violent images of animals being slaughtered and his classic Holocaust references were on full display for Israeli teenagers. Gary was warned repeatedly by the Israeli government that this was inappropriate, and he ignored them. It was a foolish thing to do because eventually higher powers would step in, and this is exactly what the Israelis did. At around 2013, Gary was banned from doing talks in schools by the Israeli Ministry of Education. A network picked up the story and aired a debate between Gary and the Israeli official. You could argue this was Gary's last chance to convince the government, to convince the audience, 
to let him speak at schools. It was a total disaster for many reasons. For one, the official does not speak English, and so the hosts have to constantly translate between Gary and the official's Hebrew, putting him in an instant disadvantage. Gary had a chance to prove on live television that he was not a crazy person, like the government described, and could tone down his message for minors. Naturally, he couldn't do it. They're flesh and skin. They tell kids that it's okay to eat things that come out of a hen's ass. They ha tell kids it's okay to eat things that drip from animal udders. They tell kids it's okay to eat flesh and blood, and people are upset with me? We'll try to translate <laughs> most of the things. You see what happened there? She didn't even need a translation. Gary, un completely unable to read the room or situation, decided to do the one thing to ensure that he will never get unbanned on live television. Because of this lack of self-awareness, does her job for her, because she can easily frame him as a crazy person to the average viewer, which is exactly what she does. It's moments like these that make me question his intelligence, but it more likely has to do with his massive ego. He can't perceive the possibility that there are concerns outside of his own, in this case the welfare of children. He struggles with empathy, especially in things he does not care about, and once you've seen so many videos, it's the same tired script. Holocaust, slavery, rape, etc. Which the Israeli official exploited perfectly. This is just one of many disaster interviews, but the most damaging would destroy any chance of spreading his work in Israel. Pro-animal rights activist slugs reporter. Animal rights guru Gary Yurofsky behaved like an animal when he saw Mariv's Irel Segal in a leather jacket. In his column Sunday, Segal writes that he was seated in a restaurant where Yurofsky walked in and noticed he was wearing a leather jacket. Things seemed to have deteriorated very quickly from that point. Now Gary Yurofsky's face is centimeters from mine. I can see the hairs in his nose. He's taunting me to give the first punch after he wished my wife and children would be raped because I was wearing a leather jacket. The man is a psychopath. He is looking for blood. I am scared, Segal confesses. I underwent a complicated stomach operation a month ago. The last thing I need is a brawl with a lunatic with blood in his eyes, who's banned from entry into Britain and Canada because of violent activity. The team around me is frightened, afraid to get close. Finally, someone tries to separate us. Yurovsky gets up. He suddenly pushes my chair. I fall to the floor. Ufer, the cameraman, takes a punch. I recover quickly and get up to defend myself. People surround me and him. Too. He curses and tries to break free. Now I'm ready. The adrenaline is pumping. The team es escorts him out of the restaurant. Further down the report, Yurovsky sees no point in caring about any human being so long as animals that are being regularly slaughtered. When people start eating up Jew flesh or uh, seared Palestinian children in between two slices of bread with onions, pickles, and mustards, then I'll be concerned about the Middle East situation, he told the website. Gary has released conflicting statements about what exactly happened, which contrasts with the reporter who is consistent with his story. Gary's first major interview after the incident was notable because it was really the first and only chance to prove to the audience that he was not an angry hothead. This was his last major chance to prove to the Israeli audience that he was not a lunatic. That interview was the Hitler was a vegetarian interview. The interview itself starts off incredibly badly because Gary is incredibly hostile, arrogant, and most importantly, not remorseful, meaning that if this went to court, they sim would simply have to play this footage. He claims that this was simply an argument. In later instances, he would claim it's self-defense. Exactly. What happened was... I got into a confrontation with some news reporter. He provoked me. Things escalated. Names were called. And he appeared to be ready to hit me, balled up his fist. And in a self-defense move, I simply pushed him down. I don't know why the whole entire Middle East is now concerned about two guys having an argument. The interview, however, completely goes off the rails when the interviewer tells Gary that it's a well-known fact that Adolf Hitler was a vegetarian. You know some Nazi leaders were vegetarian. 
Gary proceeds to lose control. That's an absolute lie and I will not tolerate that. Why do you spread lies like this? This is what the media loves to do. Even Hitler himself was. No, he wasn't. He was a meat eater just like you. These are the lies that I get upset about. Gary, I still want to thank you very much for your time and for your answers. אוקיי, אנחנו מבינים שהדברים קצת יצאו משליטה שם, לא צפינו לסיים גם את הרעיון הזה ככה, אבל כנראה שזה האיש. Gary's ideology is based upon the ideas that vegans are morally superior, and war crimes and massacres to humans happen simply from the fact people are not moral in their eating habits. For example, he famously said that there are no vegan rapists due to this superiority. It's this belief that causes him to freak out with the true statement that Adolf Hitler was in fact a vegetarian. It creates an obvious logical contradiction in his worldview, and he clearly cannot handle it. Keep in mind, he started this interview to convince people that he in fact did not assault a person for wearing a leather jacket. I mean, would you believe him after you saw this interview? It was a result of this incident and his lack of remorse that Gary soon had an indictment for his arrest and Gary, being the innocent man that he is, fled the country to avoid the inevitable trial. That huge market in Israel that Gary cultivated was gone from one outburst because he could not control his anger. After Gary was de facto banned from Israel the vegan movement, particularly in America, was noticeably less tolerant of his behavior. A large chunk of the American audience turned on him because of the incredibly poor job he was doing in representing the movement. As a result, some people became more aware of his unsavory past. To say Gary did not handle it well would be an understatement as he now used YouTube as his primary means of communication and activism. To analyze each one is a treasure in its own, but in the interest of time, I'll pick two of my favorites. Two of his comments got particular attention, one being a 2012 interview where he claimed a woman who wore fur should be violently raped. This comment would constantly bite him until his retirement. The second would be the blowback from his time in Israel, where he made a comment that the Palestinian people were psychotic and people were calling him a racist because of it. The latest lie being spread about me is that I am a racist because in a calm and sober assessment of the Israeli-Palestinian situation, I said that Palestinians are the most psychotic group of people on the planet. I stand by that statement. Gary did not respond by saying that was not correct. Gary did not respond by doubling down. He somehow made the situation worse. In a video that he posted titled Palestinian Blacks and Other Hypocrites, Gary <laughs> argues that he's not a racist because he hates all people equally. I'm really amazed that so many people want to debate which humans I hate more, when I have clearly stated time and time again that I hate all humans. Animals are the only beings that matter in my eyes. That's not better. Somehow, he took a bad situation and despite all odds, made it a hundred times worse. This is standard Gary Yurofsky post-2014, releasing statements that counter the initial assumptions with narratives that make him look even crazier. The last major topic to cover the life of Gary Yurofsky would be his melodramatic farewell in 2017. Gary had long since peaked and was in deep decline. Yes, there was a large group of fans that still followed him, but there was no potential for growth, and as time went on, that group would only shrink. Gary could no longer do the lecture tour like he did in the past because a simple Google search would reveal that he was a violent man and a danger to the classroom. The second chance he had, long since gone. His outbursts and insufferable ego made him close to a pariah in a movement that was desperate to go mainstream. There was no longer any room in veganism for a man like Gary Yurofsky, and he had a major crisis of beliefs because of it. He felt betrayed and couldn't resist getting revenge in one last statement against those who ran him out. Gary announced his retirement 
and there are many things of note. One would be his abandonment of his unshakable belief that veganism could end suffering. Backtracking previous st statements like the idea that there was no such thing as a vegan rapist. Backtracking the things he said about the Palestinians and Israelis, instead claiming that they're only the second worst people on the planet. The worst being the vegans who ran him out, who dared to tell him that perhaps his way was not the only way of doing things, for daring to put human rights on the agenda. It's an extraordinarily passive-aggressive statement, and Gary wanted to make sure he got that final word. With that, Gary was gone. He deleted his Facebook, and he killed the comment section on his YouTube videos, just in case they tried to bait him on another angry rant. His only social media presence would be through his wife's Facebook, but with that statement, Gary's story ended. An endless flash of the pan would be the best way to describe Gary's career even though it was 18 or so years. That intense heat, that intense anger maintained over a long period of time. Because he never changed. Gary was the exact same man when he wrote his song to when he screamed Hitler's was a veg at the top of his lungs. He never changed. He was always an angry man who never grew or learned, never adjusted or adapted to changing situations. His anger and ego was a constant chipping away at the successes he did have, destroying his relationships, destroying his partnerships, and finally, destroying himself. Gary could never control his rage, and it destroyed everything he cared about. There were so many points in his life where he could have turned it around, if only he could chain the beast inside of him. We all have anger inside of us. We learn to control it as children. But imagine if you didn't. Where would your life be now? Uh, G-Spot regulates the pace. Bump the bass without a second to waste. G-Spot regulates the pace. 